everybody. Thank you for sticking around until the bitter end. I apologize if I'm a little bit congested. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about viscoplastic dam break problems. We've heard about some geophysical examples of these over the last few days. I mentioned the slump test for measuring the properties of concrete and the Bostwick consistometer that measures the properties of things like consistometer. These are basically types of dam break problems. So this is the uh, problem that I'm going to focus on, a, a very idealized version of it. Um, I'll talk about two-dimensional incompressible Bingham fluid. And what I'm largely going to do is report a series of computations that were conducted by my student, Leo. It's a little difficult getting Leo to produce figures of the size that you like. And you might see that in some of the labeling later on. Okay, so there's no, really no need for me to describe the Mingham model. Let me just highlight the numerical scheme that we'll use to solve this problem. So we're going to have a block of Bingham fluid, and it will collapse under gravity. We are going to deal with the interface here, its surface, by using the volume of the fluid scheme. So in other words, we put a second fluid that's lighter, it's going to be Newtonian and smaller viscosity above it. And we'll solve half of the problem. So there's a symmetry condition at that end. There's no slip on the top and the bottom, and there's a condition similar to that one on this side. So the thing's going to slump down underneath the lighter viscous fluid to the right. So the volume of fluid scheme, it puts a concentration field in there. It smooths out the interface, and you, you basically evolve the concentration field. So C equals 1, that's the viscoplastic fluid. C equals 0 is the light and Newtonian fluid. And you can put in the material parameters using some simple linear interpolation based upon that concentration scheme. So for example, down here, I've regularized the Bingham law using the regularization parameter there. And C there, that's, that's the concentration field. And so you see the interpolation formula. So just to give you some idea of the typical parameters that we use, we have low density ratios. So rho 2 over rho 1 is 10 to the minus 3. The viscosity of this fluid divided by the viscos plastic viscosity of the Bingham fluid is 10 to the minus 3 again. Typically, we'll have the computational domain being five times larger than the thickness of the initial block. It's a little bit taller than the depth of the initial block. I'm interested in the case where inertia is not very important. So basing a Reynolds number on this velocity scale and the viscosity and density of the plastic viscosity and density of the viscoplastic fluid, I'm choosing a Reynolds number which is 10 to the minus 3. So to deal with the dynamics of the viscoplastic fluid, I will use a regularized model, but also we've used the augmented Lagrangian algorithm. That's the setup. So let me just show you some of the results. So if I take this block of Bingham fluid, it collapses under gravity, but it only does that provided the yield stress is not too big. Here are some examples of some of the computations. So I'll show you a couple of movies. These graphs are this is the run out. So that's the I think about the thing collapsing to the right. That's the furthest right of the viscoplastic fluid as a function of time. And this is the maximum depth which occurs at the left edge as a function of time. And the red and the blue are two cases. So there is a smaller yield stress case and a higher yield stress case. This is the early times. So what happens is it collapses and it comes to rest. You see it coming to rest. So here's the movies of the computation. So this is the low yield stress case. This is the concentration field. The aspect ratio is all wrong. So this, this thing here, that's the original corner, which is melting away. And this thing carries on. Doesn't do anything particularly interesting from now on. The time steps here are not uniform in time, so it looks a little funny in the movie. And this is the higher yield stress case. So what happens in this case is that this corner gets frozen in. And it stops much more quickly. Okay, 
So you should contrast that with what would, would happen if I had a Newtonian fluid. There's no surface tension in this problem, so it would just keep on spreading until it hit the right-hand edge of the computational domain. Okay, so a few more results. Uh, this is the runout and the maximum depth as a function of time for a set of different set of Bingham numbers. So I, I have the yield stress. I'm non-dimensionalizing the problem, and I'll loosely refer to this thing as the Bingham number. Okay. Some people might not like that. Anyway, so this is for different values of the dimensionless yield stress. This is the Newtonian case. Okay, and I just wanted to point out that the circles here are from the augmented Lagrangian algorithm, and the red lines are from the regularized method. So we're getting very good agreement between those two schemes. So in other words, the regularization parameter has been turned down sufficiently, and the codes are working sufficiently well that we believe both of the results are now in agreement. I'm actually going to show you mostly results for the regularized case. So here's an, one of, an example. This is an initial aspect ratio unity block that's collapsing under gravity, snapshots of the free surface, or, or actually the interface between these two fluids in the volume of fluid scheme, which has been marked by saying that that's where the concentration field equals a half. So this is, at the very end, this is a picture of the interface. It's actually the stress invariant. And here are the contours of where the stress invariant equals the yield stress. So if you're interested in plugology, there are three types of plugs that you get in this problem. There is a plug here, right, next to the symmetry axis. Basically, there's a core here which never yields. There is a plug that's associated with this corner. Sometimes, provided that the yield stress is not too small, this corner just falls and rotates under the yielded material underneath. You can see the remnant of it here, it's very small. And then there's a third plug that appears towards the end of the computation. Due to the compression at the flow front, it seems that locally the stress invariant falls below the yield stress to create another plug right here. So that's the sort of phenomenology of the plugs. Okay, so those are true plugs. Now, in this particular problem, there are two asymptotic limits that you can make some analytical headway in. One is where it's shallow, and one where, where it's very skinny. I'll say more about that later. Let's focus on what the final shape is. So, in terms of this dimensionless yield stress, or Bingham number, the leading order shallow layer theory, which goes back at least to Nye, who was looking at glaciers, predicts what the final shape should be in terms of that. Now, you can go a little bit beyond that. You can carry on in your asymptotics, you can add further terms, and if you assume that the flow comes to rest by being in a state of horizontal compression, you get this formula. Uh, so this is due to Dubachetel. And moreover, you can use slip line theory, again assuming that it's in horizontal compression, but also assuming that it yields everywhere. You can get an, another prediction of what the final shape is. It's not analytical. You have to solve a little computational problem. So this is from plasticity theory, and it doesn't have to be shallow. And so those are some results that sort of center on the fact that you have this slumping fluid that gets rather thin. There is another um, set of relations that have come up from people thinking about the slope test. So Pashias and others, they claim that there's a solid mechanics sort of view of what's going on, and uh, you can predict what the final runout and the depth is for that. It, it turns out that that's actually not a, really a solid mechanics viewpoint. It's, it's another asymptotic analysis based upon this column of Bingham fluid being thin. Okay. And then finally, there were some computations done by Stauron et al. a few years ago. There was a volume of fluid again. They were using Jerry's with a regularized model, and they provided the final runout and the final depth as a function of the Bingham number. So that's existing work. So let's have a look at the final shapes that we get. So this is for a smaller yield stress. We've got the concentration field, the stress invariant. This is tau xx, that's the horizontal extensional stress, and this is the shear stress, tau xz. The curve here 
That is the result there. There's another white curve in here, or yellow curve, which ends just there, and it matches the interface much better. That is doing this theory, but assuming that the, the, the fluid ends in a state of horizontal extension, not compression. And in fact, if you look at the stress component here, you realize that it is indeed in a state of horizontal extension. So this theory and this theory is not quite right because it has made an incorrect assumption for what the flow was doing as it came to rest. Okay, so let me just do a few more comparisons with shallow layer theory. Okay, so the shallow layer theory is basically lubrication style asymptotics. And what it predicts is that there's this strongly sheared region at the bottom, and then floating on top of that is this region that's basically a pseudo plug. It's not a real plug. It's held just above the yield stress. Okay, and it pains me to say this, but there's no such thing as a lubrication paradox here. Everything's fine, you just need to do and interpret your asymptotics properly. So this is the comparison between that asymptotics and the numerical case and the numerical results for a case that's relatively shallow. So this is the numerical flow profile that you find at different times. And this is this asymptotics. So you've got the strongly sheared region. And this is the pseudo plug, and that's this fake yield surface that divides the two. So that's the agreement that you get between the two of them. And then this is comparing, again, the final profile for a couple of different values of the Bingham number. So the solid line is the numerical result. Here, by the way, is the remnant of that corner. So the, the dashed line, that's the result of doing higher order asymptotics with the correct form for the flow in the limit. This is the leading order result due to Nye. And then this is the higher order asymptotics if you assume it's in compression. Um, I should say that those three plugs that I told you about before, um, they are not captured in this theory. They are not shallow features. It's very difficult to capture those types of plugs within this shallow model where you're assuming that the horizontal scale is much bigger than the vertical scale. Okay. Here are some final shapes for bigger yield stress. So here's this corner that gets frozen into place. This is the, the good asymptotic theory. It actually gives you an amazingly good prediction for the final run out, despite the fact that the shape's completely wrong. Now, this is sort of a very recent result, and I'm not sure whether it's correct. So if you look at this very slender limit, what happens is that most of the block remains unyielded. It, liquefies at the bottom, spreads out, so it's squished down, and the computations seem to generate these very curious features, and you get these very strange zigzag-shaped yielded regions. This is a comparison of the final profiles with the slender column asymptotics, so blue versus red. So the slender column asymptotics does a fair job, except for the fact you get these short-scale wiggles, which I'm not completely sure whether they're true or not, or an artifact of the numerical scheme. We have to chase that down. It could be, but we have to check. Okay, so summary of the final shapes. So the solid line are computation starting with a unit square. These red lines are the higher order asymptotics. That's the leading order asymptotics. The green dots are various experiments that Dubash et al. did using various kinds of materials. The uh, results of Pashyash are here and here. So I told you that, that was basically a skinny column type of asymptotics. These are the profiles from which this data is taken. And they're not particularly skinny, so it's not surprising that they don't do a particularly good job of matching up with the experimental data. And this line here, that's an empirical formula that Staron et al. came up with from their computations, it doesn't agree very well at all with ours, and I think that's because of the detail of how you implement the no-slip condition on the bottom. Okay, so conclusions, I'll leave you to read those. Um, I'll, I'll just say that we had some significant issues associated with that last detail. With a no-slip condition, the second fluid gets overridden in a very narrow finger, which is extremely hard to resolve. Let's vote to like this. Oh.
Artistic ability? <laughs> oh, come on, Anthony. <laughs> Overall score. <laughs> 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 <laughs>